This week, is the AOPA out of control? Baumgartner's long, lonely leap is coming up, and another GA airport is under attack by proposed FAA regulations. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to the Tuesday bi-weekly edition of Airborne here on Aero TV. And in an exclusive investigative report appearing on the Monday edition of Aero News, it appears that not all is well at 421 Aviation Way, AOPA's headquarters. Over the course of the last few months, and in particular under the direction of current President Craig Fuller, AOPA is dealing with some tough issues and reportedly losing ground. ANN has received growing and credible substantiated reports of member disillusionment, the pullout of major donors, the loss of senior personnel, an alleged downward trend in AOPA's influence in Washington, spending controversies, staff morale issues, and an increasing insistence in making money, while the once well-defined mission seems to be off target. A careful but strongly worded letter written by several of aviation's most notable companies has taken AOPA to task for actions they see as needlessly and wrongfully competing with private industry. The letter says, quote, We believe AOPA products and initiatives that detract from the organization's main goals are bad for members and the industry in general. And as advertisers, we feel our financial contributions are furthering these initiatives that will ultimately compete with our own products. Essentially, we are funding a competitor, end quote. Within hours of the receipt of the letter, one of the signatories, Sporty's Pilot Shop, was fired from its multi-year AOPA marketing program and told to pack its bags. While the organization has apparently decided not to meet with the letter's authors as a group, they did seem to indicate that they might meet them one at a time. To read more on the evolving story, be sure to check out Monday's lead story at www.aero-news.net. Mission managers for the Red Bull Stratus program say that Felix Baumgartner is prepping for his record-setting freefall from the fringe of space, scheduled for October the 8th. If all goes according to plan, Baumgartner will exit his capsule some 23 miles over the New Mexico desert and break the sound barrier as he returns to Earth. In July, Baumgartner jumped from 18 miles in a tune-up for the record attempt. He had originally planned to make the record jump in August, but his capsule was damaged in the last test run and needed to be repaired. The program's managers now say that the capsule has been repaired and tested. The plan calls for Baumgartner to reach a top speed of 690 miles per hour in freefall, breaking the sound barrier with his body. It would set records for the highest jump and the fastest speed achieved during a freefall. The current altitude record is 18 miles, and the speed record is 614 miles per hour. Both were set by former U.S. Air Force Captain Joe Kittinger during a military project in 1960. Vancouver's Pearson Airport sits near the banks of the Columbia River, which makes up the border between Oregon and Washington State. So does Portland International Airport, just a couple of miles away. Pilots using the airport are concerned that new airspace restrictions proposed by the FAA may leave them without a home. The two airports have operated in close proximity without incident for 75 years. The new plan was to have gone into effect October 1st, but the agency has reopened comments on the plan after receiving complaints from local pilots. Pearson Field Airport Manager Willie Williamson said that the airport generates some $27 million for the local economy, when operations at the airport and the museum on the grounds are considered. He said that flight restrictions could delay pilots inbound for landing at the uncontrolled airfield, forcing them to circle over residential neighborhoods while they wait for clearance. 
that basically puts the airport out of business, Williamson said. Local officials say the answer to the problem is to build and staff a control tower at KVUO. Williamson said that mitigates all the airspace concerns, as well as those about FAA compliance with its own regulations. The problem reported with a GENX 1B engine on a pre-delivery Dreamliner is apparently not contained to a single airplane. Tom Patton explains. The NTSB is continuing its investigation of an incident which occurred on July 28th involving a Dreamliner that experienced a loss of thrust in the right engine, a GENX 1B turbofan, during a pre-first flight low-speed taxi test at Charleston International Airport in Charleston, South Carolina. As reported in an earlier update, the investigation found that the forward end of the fan midshaft, or FMS, fractured and separated. Now examination of other pre-delivery engines revealed a second GENX-1B engine with a cracked FMS that was installed on a 787-8 airplane that had not yet flown. The initial inspection of all in-service GENX engines has now been completed. On September 11th, the Boeing 787-8F with GENX-2B turbofan engines experienced a loss of power in the number one engine during its takeoff roll at Shanghai Pudong International Airport in Shanghai, China. The Civil Aviation Administration of China is investigating that incident, and preliminary findings revealed that the FMS was intact and showed no signs of cracking. The NTSB is participating as the country of design and manufacture of the engine and aircraft. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. You're watching Airborne when we come back. SpaceX's grasshopper kinda sorta hops. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop us an email to news spy at aero news.net. On Friday, September 21st, SpaceX's Grasshopper vertical takeoff and landing test vehicle took its first test flight from the company's rocket testing facility in McGregor, Texas. The short hop of approximately six feet is the first major milestone for Grasshopper and a critical step toward a reusable first stage for SpaceX's proven Falcon 9 rocket. Grasshopper consists of a Falcon 9 first stage, a Merlin 1D engine, four steel landing legs, and a steel support structure. SpaceX is working to develop vehicles that are fully and rapidly reusable, a key element to radically reducing cost and increasing the efficiency of spaceflight. The rocket is designed to be part of a larger spacecraft system that is completely reusable. The system would allow SpaceX to recover the Falcon 9 heavy launch vehicle after a flight with a soft landing on legs rather than falling into the ocean. Testing of Grasshopper continues with the next big milestone, a hover at roughly 100 feet, expected in the next several months. Honda Aircraft Company broke ground last week on a new maintenance repair and overhaul facility located at the Piedmont Triad International Airport in Greensboro, North Carolina. 
The 90,000 square foot building will be completed next year, with occupancy slated for the second half of 2013, prior to the Honda Jet Aircraft's entry into service. Honda Aircraft's MRO facility will complement the existing network of Honda Jet dealers, with all locations delivering the same customer service experience. The new Honda Aircraft MRO facility includes a 24-7 support center to facilitate maintenance for up to 12 aircraft simultaneously. There will be several back shops for composite and sheet metal structures, avionics and interiors, and a customer area with a large pilot's lounge, individual workrooms with conference space, and a flight planning room conveniently situated near the aircraft ramp side entrance. It's Tuesday and time for our Aero Video of the Week. This week, watch as the Space Shuttle Endeavour is mounted atop NASA's shuttle carrier aircraft in preparation for its ferry flight to California. The SCA modified 747 jetliner flew Endeavour to Los Angeles, where it will be placed on public display at the California Science Center. This was the final ferry flight scheduled in the Space Shuttle program era. Finally, today on Airborne, a TSA screener working at Orlando International Airport was found to be in possession of an iPad that was left at a screening checkpoint by ABC News in an effort to determine the extent of a theft problem among screeners. The tablet was one of 10 purposely left at various checkpoints at airports around the country. The owners of the other nine devices were contacted by TSA using names and phone numbers clearly displayed on the device's cases, as is the agency's policy. But the tablet left at Orlando continued to be missing for 15 days. The producers had used a tracking app to follow the device from the airport some 30 miles to the home of TSA screener Andy Ramirez. When the news crew got to his home, he initially told them he knew nothing about the device. But when they activated an Audible alarm app on the tablet, he produced and turned it over, taking off his uniform shirt. He said he was, quote, embarrassed because his wife had taken it from the airport. His wife backed up the story, saying she had found the device and not told her husband. When the news crew asked why there was video surveillance of him handling the iPad at a security checkpoint, he reportedly shut the door and would not say anything further. The TSA says they have a zero-tolerance policy for thefts at airports. Ramirez is reportedly no longer employed by the agency. Well, that's our program for Tuesday, October 2nd. Quick, concise, and convenient, you're always up to date when you're airborne with Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again this Friday with another edition of Airborne.